All right, now let's go and get into some pre-calculus errors. So a lot of times on semester exams, we're going to be dealing with uh, some functions, right? We're going to we talk about the domain of functions, and we need to make sure we understand the domain restrictions. Remember these domain restrictions. And really, there's two common ones that we like to focus on, and that is you cannot divide by zero, and you cannot take the square root of a negative number, okay? So remember those two restrictions. I'll kind of focus these. You Number one, you cannot divide by zero. Okay, so if I had like a function like f of x is equal to one over x minus two, like what is the value that makes my denominator equal to zero? It's two, right? So my domain is all real numbers except for two, right? All real numbers except x cannot equal two. And you can write this in interval notation, negative infinity to two, union two to infinity. Uh, the number one, the second one, sorry, is going to be you cannot take the square root of a negative number. So cannot take the square root of negatives, okay? And that actually works for any even root. But again, if I have like a different function here, let's do g of x and let's say it's x minus two, okay? To simplify the domain, I say, all right, my domain needs to be x has to be greater than or equal to whatever, oh, I'm sorry, take whatever is under your radical, x minus two, has to be greater than or equal to zero. You can take the square root of zero, you just cannot take the square root of a negative number. So when I add two to the both sides, I get x has to be greater than or equal to zero. If I wanted to write that as a domain, um, if I wanted to write that as a domain, we just say that's gonna be from zero to infinity. Now the next one is going to be composition, okay? Now again, a lot of students understand number one and two, but then once we deal with composition, things get a lot more fuzzy, okay? So, we need to make sure that we, um, when we're doing composition of functions, you take the domain, let's say domain of composition. Okay, now when you're doing this, you need to make sure you do the domain of a the inner function, that's the function you're plugging into the other function, as well as the resultant function. Okay, so once you go ahead and combine them, you simplify them, make sure you find the domain of that. So you gotta find the intersection of the, of the inner domain, the function's inner domain, as well as the resultant function. The other one's also just to remember in semester one, a lot of times we also go over, excuse me, uh, we go over inverse trigonometry as well as logarithm. So make sure you also remember that for logarithms, it's x is greater than zero, and uh, you can only take the logarithm of numbers that are larger than zero and not including zero. And then remember the domain restrictions for, uh, actually, let's just kind of write these out. So I have number four is logs, x has to be greater than zero. And number five is going to be inverse trig. And then remember we have those restrictions on for cosine is going to be from zero to pi. And then sine and tangent is going to be from negative pi halves to pi halves. Okay, all right, let's get into rational functions with asymptotes. So a lot of times we gotta be able to identify the asymptotes. Sometimes that's just a blatant question. And then sometimes those questions are referring to, you know, being able to help us graph it. So if I have a function like h of x is equal to one over x minus three. Remember the asymptote is going to be the value that is not a part of your domain, right? that is undefined for your domain, but that cannot be removed. So in this case, I have a vertical asymptote at x is going to equal to three. Now, sometimes we get um, the big big issue that we kind of come up with asymptotes is if we had something like this, x plus two, and then now we're deleting into, let's say x minus three, okay? What students will see is they say, oh, the vertical asymptote's x minus three. No, we'll see, these are separated by multiplication, guys that actually gets divided out. So uh, let's not call that h of x, let's call this uh, um, k of x. So at k of x, at x equals three, which is a undefined value, we have a what we call a whole. It's not a vertical asymptote, okay? So whenever, if you have a discontinuity that can be divided or removed, what we say, that is going to be a whole, not a vertical asymptote. The other big mistake that I see students make is if they have another function, let's say like g of x, and that gives us like a 3x divided by 3x minus six, okay? Now we always wanna factor it, right? We wanna rewrite terms as a factor. 
So therefore I rewrite this as a three X divided by three times X minus two done correctly. And then students say, Oh, these divide out. So, you know, my vertical asymptote is at X equals three. No, ladies and gentlemen, right? These are what we call scalars for it to be a vertical asymptote, but has to be a discontinuity. That means it has to make your denominator equal to zero. Three does not, it make my three does not make my denominator equal to zero. The only value that makes my denominator zero is going to be X equals two and it cannot be removed. So it's not a whole, it's a vertical asymptote. All right, uh, let's go over, over some trig. Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, if I have X times X, we know that to be an X squared. Agreed? But if I have sine of X times a sine of X, we don't write this as sine of X quantity squared. What we could write it as, as sine of X quantity squared, or the preferred method is going to be a sine squared of X, okay? This is going to be our preferred method, but this method works perfectly fine. This can get confused that you're squaring the X when it's actually the trigonometric function sine of X is what's actually being squared. So we like to avoid using this, but we want to be able to use those two. Uh, the next two common mistakes, and again, these are mistakes that I still make sometimes to this day, is knowing your unit, uh, is knowing the first quadrant of your unit circle. So ladies and gentlemen, just, it comes with practice. You don't need to memorize the whole unit circle. You do need to know what these points are though and the angles that they correspond to, okay? So a lot of students will get these mixed up. They forget about them. There's a hand trick you can use or you can just practice over and over and over. And just like you have the times tables memorized, or I hope you do, you'll get these memorized. But a lot of students will switch up these two points and these two points, okay? So these two points is 30 degrees or what we say pi over six. This angle is 45 degrees or pi over four, and this angle is going to be six degrees or pi over three. So make sure you understand the first quadrant because then I have a lot of videos um, that can help you being able to evaluate for the rest of the unit circle, but students make mistakes either forgetting them or mixing up the points all the time. And I don't want you to get a problem wrong because you simply just forgot or made that simple mistake, right? It's a simple mistake. You understand what to do, but you get the problem wrong and you get no credit for it because you made that mistake. So don't do that, all right? 